Thank you for coming along this evening to share with me some views on creativity. It's, a, as it were, a work in progress. Creativity is the broad topic, more specifically, creativity in music, more specifically still, creativity in music performance. More specific still, perhaps, the focus of tonight is drummers, about whom I know something, um, but it could have been other popular music instrumentalists. It's just that my research was based on expert Western kit drummers. Creativity is its a slippery customer, isn't it? It's really tricky. It's a valuable and useful component, for sure, of uh, human cognition and psychological functioning. What, though, is its relationship to popular music instrumental performance? How might performance be creative? Creativity is not always welcome or necessary in popular music, so unsurprisingly, it's not always prioritized. Yet many of the people I've met and worked with seem to me to have been stratospherically creative. In what way are they so? Why are they so? Why is it important that we try to be so too? You may not think much about creativity when you play. Perhaps you're too just caught up in trying to get the notes in the right order. Very common. You may be the opinion that just playing a musical instrument in and of itself is sufficient. That's creative enough. You may think any further creative effort is just sort of self-indulgent, a word you hear quite a lot when associated with any kind of creative effort. Today I want to examine some of these ideas through the creative action of four very different drummers and their creative responses in four very different music situations. Get our brains thinking about the topic. What do instrumentalists do? Is there anything creative about it? And if so, how might such creativity inform our practice? I'm not going to tell the uh, practicing musicians amongst you uh, how to be creative or how to be more creative or even how to be creative in different ways. We'll let the four case studies speak for themselves. We're going to do this in three ways, really, in three sections. First, to look broadly at the phenomenon of creativity, its origins, importance, locus, definitions, and critique some creativity models. Second, we'll drill down into creative music performance, situating it on a continuum of control in two modes of performance that I identify as the functional and the compositional. If you like the functional, the doing something well or doing something better, the compositional, broadly construed, is doing something differently. Framed within four performance contexts, that is to say working with people, for someone, working with someone, working as a leader, working without a leader, and then we'll illustrate, fourth, we'll illustrate, thirdly, we'll illustrate how creativity is mediated by each performance context in four real-world case studies. The, there are some delimitations. The focus is very much on instrumentalists within popular music. We're not addressing classical music performance this evening or the sort of distributed creativity which describes the networked cultural production of geographically uh, dispersed people just simply not enough time to cover everything. We're not looking at the quantitative dimensions of creativity, how it's measured. Today we're more interested in assessing it rather than measuring it. And what I'm interested in is individual creativity within the collaboration, the intersection of my creativity with yours to make something the two of us didn't know we were going to get, the sum of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Why is any of this important? Well, on the psychological level, there's proven linkage between control, creativity, and wellness. Contemporary thinking within performance psychology suggests that greatest performer happiness lies in those areas which accommodate and welcome the personal expressive input of the performer, which afford him or her a sense of control over his or her own performance. At the cultural level, Scientists, authors, government agencies all maintain that creativity lies at the heart of the modern economy. So we need the clearest possible understanding of what creativity might be and its many manifestations. Popular music has been designated as part of the creative arts industry by policymakers in government and academia. But the extent to which its practitioners, its instrumental players, are actually creative has really been interrogated and our understanding of the experience of creativity even less so. Within developmental studies, 
enhancing problem solving and critical thinking skills in children gives rise to later life creative skills valuable in the so-called creative economy we're preparing them for. So everyone seems to want creativity, readily evoked as a good thing, almost never as a bad thing, with the possible exception of that wonderful thing, creative accounting, which is one of the few, one of the few uses of a negative use of the term. But we don't seem to know quite what it is or where it is to be found. What's more, it tends to change its address fairly frequently over time. Contemporary ideas situate it variously in the person, product or process, the three, P, the three P's, and crucially, as I shall argue as, as I continue, in the quality of the relationship between these three. In the beginning, as they say on the left there, God was the creator of all things. With the post-enlightenment rise of the individual, creativity was seen as a divine or mysterious process in the gift of the gods, but now bestowed upon the so-called lone genius, Beethoven, Michelangelo, Mozart, slaving away in their garrets. In other words, it became personified. Nowadays, far from being in the province alone of the highly gifted, we are all held to share a cognitive apparatus capable of creativity. As Donald Treffinger has pointed out, while not everyone will, anyone might become creative in meaningful ways. Only some, however, are given to employing that apparatus in a manner likely to produce a creative act on a spectrum ranging from the everyday sort of creativity employed by many, known uh, frequently as little c creativity, to the novel, useful, surprising creativity accepted as such by a field of experts and in the gift of very few, known as big C creativity. Little c creativity includes everyday problem solving, the ability to adapt to change, and arguably, for example, the ability to learn how to play a musical instrument to a rudimentary standard. Big C creativity, far more rare, held to occur when a person solves a problem or creates an object that has a major impact on how we think, feel, and live our lives. In drama terms, perhaps change the way subsequent practitioners come to view the very role and function of the instrument itself. Is creativity perhaps in the product, in the thing itself, in this artwork, this CD? Is it the outcome of this imaginative thinking? Is there more creativity in that award-winning Turner Prize installation there, or more creativity over here in that award-winning one? Is it there in the score that Beethoven is working on? Or is it a process? The head of music at one of the most prestigious schools in England said recently, we want every student to experience the creative process. Well, what does he mean by that? It's great. He's in tune with contemporary thinking that repossessions musical creativity away from the person or product and towards processual aspects, such as those of collaboration and interaction. So it's not so much a thing, something you do with others. The contemporary belief that music performance embodies some degree of creativity as a matter of course is widely held, but it's quite a new idea that. As recently as the mid 20th century, the performer was typically seen as the mouthpiece of the composer whose explicit will was to be carried out to the letter. Here Schoenberg, for example, deemed the performer to be totally unnecessary, except as his interpretations make the music understandable to an audience, unfortunate enough not to be able to read it in print. Now there's a thought. For Pierre Boulez, instrumentalists do not possess invention, otherwise they would be composers. For many composers, the performer existed as a necessary evil whose function was to serve the composer. Contemporary performers, however, see creativity as synonymous with putting something of yourself into the music. I'm quite sure how that's done, but that's broadly the idea, put something of me into the music. An idea that sits uncomfortably with these composers who required the performer put nothing of herself or himself into the performance. So until quite recently, the mid-20th century, the chances of an individual performer being seen as creative were very slim, with creative assessment addressed to the merits of the composition and its effective transmission in performance rather than any individual's interpretation of the work. But things change. Current thinking now highlights creative performance as 
an action in between actors and their environment, rather than a psychological phenomenon entirely located within the individual mind. It's an interactive network of people cooperating that involves reorganizing the connection or relationship an individual has with the situation, rather than reorganizing that which occurs within the person's mind. My own research uh, among expert drummers suggests that for them, creative performance is embedded within a meaningful shared experience around collaboration and community. Early models of creativity of the mysterious process emerged from science and mathematics and typically proposed a number of stages. Preparation, that is to say the immersion in the domain of knowledge. Incubation, the mind continues working on the problem below the threshold of consciousness. Illumination, aha, E equals MC squared. And four, verification. Others confirm that indeed E does equal MC squared. But stage models like this uh, tell us a little about a creativity in the immediacy of performers, in the immediacy of performance, dancers perhaps, or actors, uh, musicians' perceptions of creativity are tempered by the immediacy of the usually collaborative moment in which they must communicate significant difference, literally perform. In another view, the creative process is a dynamic system. Mihai Chik Shep Mihai's 1988 systems model of creativity, for example, the triangle at the bottom of the screen, uh, shows how a creative products are continually generated by an individual or individuals, assessed by experts in the field, and integrated back into the domain of our historical and cultural experience, or rejected. Most prevalent line of critique here points to the model's focus on the domain-changing contribution of an individual, a focus that fails to offer a satisfactory account of the construction and assessment of the more everyday kind of distributed and collaborative creativity undertaken by many popular music instrumentalists. It doesn't tell us much about a creative process or product that is recognized and adopted or adapted by others without necessarily seeking to change the domain. It doesn't say much, for example, about collective creativity, about um, children's creativity, about slow incremental improvement over time. So here's the dilemma on the back of a postcard. If everybody who can play three chords on a guitar is creative, then the term is devalued to the point of recklessness. Equally, if those who have the ability to change the way we perform are creative, Jimi Hendrix, Coltrane, Beatles, all the great guys, Miles Davis, Max Roach, whoever it is, then that seems too exclusive. So conceptions of little c everyday creativity are too inclusive, big C, everyday creativity, too exclusive, and stage models, somewhat too static. What can we all more or less agree on? Let's approach from a different angle. Many accounts of music creativity stipulate four things that should really happen. Creativity in general, well, actually, this is music creativity. First, something has to be selected, something has to be differentiated, Something has to be communicated, something has to be assessed. And then you might have a creative performance. To decide what to play on requires something needs to be, the selection of something. For drummers, those selections tend to be made at whatever level of consciousness from a palette of temporal, metrical, timbral, dynamical options available in the moment of performance and subject to various constraints. Secondly, uh, the, the selection needs to be differentiated. What counts is not where you get it from, but where you take it to. In other words, how have you differentiated it? What Many conceptions of creativity coalesce around the idea that the process or product should be useful and novel. But novelty is not without contention in music circles, and it's not much help to us here. If the drumming, in my case, I'll keep referring to drummers, but that's only because I am one, but it, this applies in generalizes quite possibly to others as well. If the drumming had not been derived, copied, imitated, or translated from any other previous type of drumming, i.e. it is completely new, it would not be recognizable as drumming. John Hope Mason asks a much better question. Not is it new, but does it matter? 
Is it significant? Third requirement is that something needs to be communicated, giving rise to questions such as what, how, and to whom are you communi to communicating? And finally, creativity requires some sort of assessment. But who is assessing what and for whom? The gatekeepers in the field, all those who can affect the structure of the domain of knowledge, are judging the performance, I'd suggest, for its degree of significance. Not is it new, does it matter? A performance may well be novel, useful and appropriate, but its difference should qualify as significant to appropriate observers. Crudely put, do I care about it? How can I use it? As yet, we have no single metric for knowing where or when variation becomes newness. In music, uh, music performance, all variation, of course, is in some way new, but not always significant, and it is creativity that transforms the one into the t'other, the other. So this observation gives us the key to unlock an operational definition of creative performance at the bottom, which I could throw out. Creative music performance resides in the ability to affect and communicate significant difference. For our purposes tonight, really, the most useful expansion of current creativity models keeps creativity within a framework but draws upon theories of the extended mind and distributed cognition to focus on a relationship between the self and others and conceptualizes creativity as symbolic, meaningful action. Vlad Glavinu's cultural psychology of creativity sees creativity less as a thing, more as an action in and on the world. His particular account of distributed creativity, which we're going to examine the drummers, four drummers through in a minute, locates the phenom phenomenon not within people or objects, but in between people and objects. In this framework, the five A's framework, creativity is distributed between rather than resides within the action, the drumming, uh, of an actor, the drummer, the artifact, the performance. Exploiting the existing affordances, what's possible in the domain, for example, a previously unimagined use or conception of the drum kit. This distribution exists in relation to an audience, construed in the broadest terms, an audience of listeners, non-performing colleagues, co-performers, possibly promoters and results in music artefacts or performances that are considered to be new, useful and significant. From the relational interaction of these five elements uh, emerge three dimensions of distributed creativity and you can see them springing out to the side there, sociality, temporality and materiality. Worth looking at each one of them briefly on their own. Temporality some of the exceptionality of the creative creativity associated with music performance resides in a temporal spectrum, ranging from the immediacy, the performance moment at which you strike the drum or the cymbal, to the fluid assessment of, of a performing life over the decades following the performer's death. Changing the way people live and think and act, which is, after all, the ultimate goal of domain change, takes time. Descriptions of creativity are notoriously fluid and changeable over time, as in, for example, the case of 15th century Italian painter Botticelli, who was phenomenally out of fashion for about 300 years, or the pre-Raphaelites, or anyone who played in progressive rock. The meaning of creativity then is tied to ever-changing historical processes, technologies, social conditions, and conceptions of individual and society. The systems model cannot, uh, cannot, can, at best it seems, ascribe creativity only at a frozen moment in time. Materiality, the bottom one, inheres, for example, in the relational space between the actor and the cultural artifact, which in this case could be the drum kit, or perhaps the prior recordings of cultural elders. The creative musical imagination is materialized and made meaningful through a performance that embodies and is inhabited by the influence of material artifacts. Any music artifact, be it a performance or a recording or an instrument, bears the mark of the intentionality of the maker. And yet each object 
that has the potential, has the, each, each object has the potential to transcend its designed use, to escape the intentionality of the maker. In my world, the design brief for the embryonic electronic drum in the late 20th century was that it should sound like a drum. Big mistake right there. Alarmed but intrigued by how far the end result failed to even approximate the design brief, the question rapidly became much more interesting and ontological. How, <clears throat> how unlike the sound of a drum could a drum be while remaining a drum? What alternative creative opportunities might this unfortunate artifact afford? In this way, the material object had agency in its guidance of creative outcomes. So that's material object having agency. One aspect of the sociality of instrumental performance, so prevalent when we view music as, music as co-creation, is manifest in its enactment for, with, um, as, or without a leader, the four lower of the blue bubbles there. While not finely delineated, these four performance contexts may be mapped along a functional compositional continuum of control. F, functional on the far, my far right, your left, compositional this end. Ranging from the hard functional extremity through the soft functional and soft compositional to the opposite end, the hard compositional polarity. All with implications for creative inscription. From left to right, the hard functional performance is typically enacted when performer choices are under acute direction, a lot of direction, very little room for maneuver, performing for a leader. Soft functional performance, edging towards the middle, is typically enacted in the collaboration with a leader. Constraints are loosened, suggestions are requested and required and, and taken on board. Soft compositional performance as a leader requires that there's no external direction and choice selection is pretty much what and how to play, constrained only by the considerations of the particular musicians you're working with and the, the gig you're on. And the example here is of Asaf Circus is he wrote the music in which he's, he's compositionally providing the drum part for. Hard compositional performance on the hard right is often manifest in solo or duo performance without a leader, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and constraints of any nature are at their loosest. So the performer's freedom to choose and select is constrained not least by the degree of control he or she has, with that degrees, degree increasing as we slide from left to right, depending upon the music situation we're in. Meet Paul Bonney. You might have already met Paul Bonney, I don't know, of the uh, Australian Pink Floyd. Manchester boy, you can tell by the hat. <laughs> he discusses two levels of preparation or immersion in the domain, if you like, the incubation period, the individual and the collective. I studied, and I quote, I studied Nick Mason intently and watched all the videos, how he finished when going around the kit and all that. His technical side was a lot different to mine, to say the least. I mastered the way he did it and I changed my technical side. Before the audition, I used a room at the MEN arena with a huge PA in my kit. I practiced four hours a night over five days a week for three weeks. Before I went into practice, I was studying, watching videos, and listening intently to the albums and bootlegs as well. I'll play you two little slices of music, same piece of music, separated by some 37 years or so. Um, the one being the original, the second being Australian Pink Floyd, and just bear in mind that the, the Unfortunately, I'm not quite comparing like for like. One, of course, was recorded under studio conditions. The other is recorded under live performance, and you'll hear the drums are set further back in the mix. Please pay attention to the drums if you can. I know it's difficult. <laughs> Please pay attention to the drums, because that's what the, uh, the interest is here. Out there on your own, sitting naked by the phone, you touch me. to call out the
of attention to detail there, isn't there, in this delivery of this oral facsimile. Paul secures not only the uh, same instruments, but also the services of Mason's drum tech, Clive Brooks, who can advise on stylistic odds and ways of doing things. Quote, I've done everything imaginable to try to replicate Nick's sound. I always went for a dark side of the moon sound for the Thompson snares. A snare. Over the years, I've been working on my cymbals. I can't get any closer to Nick because I'm with Peisty, symbol manufacturer. Now, having Clive Brooks as my drum tech helps as well. He's set up Nick's kit for decades, so you can't get any better. He used to help me out with the playing side as well." End quote. So having honed his personal contribution, the work continued collectively through an exhaustive preparation schedule with other group members. Uh, Bonnie says, we do everything more or less to a T Beat for beat from the album, presumably the more or less, leaves a small window in which the less is considered unacceptable and distinguishes a good gig from a poor one. The dimensions of creativity that we've looked at so far are generally associated with the creative process, novelty, utility, significant difference, are conspicuous by their absence here. Paul and the band stick to the script in the goal of satisfaction of listeners' expectations, a policy which might be seen to be avoiding the injection of any creativity. In Paul's view, it's this that distinguishes APF's approach from other tribute bands that, quote, move off the beaten track and put their own little bit to it. We don't. Clearly, he's recreating a script previously created by others. The fans, when they come to watch the gig, expect to hear it as it is on the album. If we make a mistake, we're distraught with ourselves because we've been doing it for a long time. People, by which he means other tribute bands, uh, want to put their own feel on things. But we say stick to the script because that's what the audience wants to hear. So his performance practice here rec represents an extreme case, a hard functional case of, um, of performance practice. Um, and I think can probably be situated at the hard functional end of the FCC, the functional con compositional um, continuum. He studiously avoids differentiation, which is a key component of creative action. Few conceptualizations of creativity, the way we've, we've, we've framed it so far, looking at his work would attribute creativity on the basis of his description. In the systems model reading, that was the triangle, um, information has indeed been transmitted from the domain to the individual in the sense that he's learnt, for example, uh, Pink Floyd's repertoire and been absorbed by the individual. Um, but but while, while widely acknowledged by the field, uh, no variations have been offered. There's no variation here for consideration. So selection back into the domain is impossible. In Glavenu's interpretation, that's the five A's framework, the interaction or su of some or all of those A's, the five A's, is required at a minimum, irrespective of any domain-changing outcome. 
So for either way, it's hard to ascribe creativity there in that particular example. Here's another guy. Let's try Blair Sinter. Uh, the second case study highlights the problem-finding, problem-solving skills. Now, problem-finding, problem-solving are root base fundamentals of creativity. And many people are happy to settle with that, just that idea that creativity is only solving a problem. Blair finds one problem and is given another, along with a set of more or less favourable circumstances, but not much time to solve them. Drummers frequently identify and solve problems while under personal, temporal or peer group pressure. The sense of crisis of having to do something in a hurry is engendered in studio and live performance, but counterintuitively it might promote creativity. Interesting drum kit, isn't it there? Tambourines, tape and towels. You might call it the tambourine, tape and towels kit, I think. Um, and Blair, in this, I'm sorry about the amount of text in this, it's always a no-no to do that, but I'm going to leave it up there while I play some audio, and Blair is going to talk you through it for about line, line five. He's describing the kit, lines four, five, and six, and then what he does with it, lines sort of seven, eight, nine, around there. So he'll talk you through the track, uh, which I'll play, and again, if you wouldn't mind focusing on the drums. Well, I've been, I've been thinking There's something I'm not talking about The whispers have found me Inside the shadows of my doubts I get the feeling that everything I'm doing now I'm doing wrong I think 
uh, Blair's description um, up here is this really sophisticated little kind of micro-analysis in that it goes to the heart of the drummer's art, how to restrain and hold back while supplying forward momentum or swing or energy. It's also a problem that needs a quick solution. Time is money, as we said. He's expected to both be able to cross-refer widely to artists in, uh, in other genres and styles of music, be fully, fully conversant with their histories and their current practice. His combined solution to the second problem, how to both pay homage to and modernize the Motown aesthetic simultaneously, is to ride on the muted 14-inch floor tom. This kills two birds with one stone. First, it solves his restraint with energy issue. Second, it references Marvin Gaye's I Heard It Through the Grapevine, which uses just such a ploy to good effect. Blair's reference to the sound we created collectively on this tune indicates that the sound is understood as being dedicated to this track only and that the drum kit will be reconfigured for the next track. So note how the music dictates the components of the kit rather than the other way around. The instrument itself is in permanent reconstruction in service of the music. Just a quick uh, reminder of Glavineau's model. Act, the actor here is Blair, of course. The audience, Etheridge first user, not the end user, never mind the guy in the street. This is Etheridge, he's got to get past first. So she is the audience in this instance. The artifact is the performance, the action is the drumming. And all three of Glavineau's strands, temporality, sociality and materiality are present in this. The temporal aspect is evident in the restraint with energy issue and the sense of crisis, having to do things in a hurry. The materiality of Blair's performance in here is in the subtle choice of components and their forensic care and the forensic care taken in their positioning. The use of the tambourines further highlights the Motown connection while pointing to both the fluid nature and improvised approach to the mediational means, as they say, or the drum kit itself. Finally, the interaction between the actor Blair and the audience Etheridge evokes the 5A's social dimension of creative distribution. It surfaces first in Sinter's adopted role of the invisible composer, offering creative input and problem-solving skills while remaining anonymous in terms of authorship. And second, in joint attribution of the sound we created collectively. So from a wide variety of percussive possibilities, Blair is trying to produce exactly what Etheridge would have requested if A, she knew it existed, and B, she knew how to get it. Etheridge is conducting the sessions in a way that creativity theorists would understand, providing what Pamela Bernard has identified as, quote, opportunities to experiment, negotiate, make judgments within the social system in which specific works are created. Sinter is working both for and with Etheridge on that blurred line between the two lower blue bubbles with a sus substantial measure of agentive control. So this performance I would classify probably as highly creative and soft functional, situated on this porous border close to the compositional side of the FCC. Meet our third man, Asaf Sirkis. The comments of the case study people that I've been uh, talking about so far have been drawn from their public utterances. Asaf uh, his comments were taken from a research interview which I conducted with him in 2014. So this is the only one that affords direct and private access to the drummer's lived experience. Asaf, for those who don't know him, is a fiercely committed Israeli-British jazz drummer of international reputation in the community, active in the profession for more than 25 years. Alongside multiple credits as a sideman on jazz dates for others, he's written, directed and produced eight CDs, probably nine by now of original material. The dimensions most generally associated with creativity that were, that were conspicuously absent from Bonnie's work uh, are conspicuously present here in Asaf's compulsion to take the road less traveled. He says, quote, when I see a lot of people going in one direction, I have to go the other way. Looking down the left-hand side of the slide, uh, he has an inclusive, holistic view of the phenomenon of creativity. Creativity is something that everyone has. It has no address, not dependent on time or place. 
You can invite it, you can allow it, but I don't think you can actually cultivate it and accumulate it. It's not a commodity. It's an expression of human worthiness and, like oxygen, vital to human survival. Is creativity optional or non-optional? Can you turn it on or off, like a tap? Good question. A useful skill if you can develop it. For Bonnie of APF, it seems that it's optional. He chooses to withhold the creative impulse as a matter of professional judgment in his work. For Sirkis, on the contrary, it is non-optional. He surrenders to it entirely. For him, the phenomenon is unavoidable because there are always challenges that make one think in another, another way as so you have to be creative. Creativity, he says, is just one of these things we always have. We always drink water, we always breathe, and we always have to be creative. Otherwise, we cannot survive. He insists that he has no other choice but to play differently because everyone is different. Stay true to yourself, he advises, and your singularity will eventually shine through in your music. He makes multiple references on the right-hand side to the circumstances of allowing or being allowed, which affords creative action, allowing mistakes to be made, things to go wrong, allowing a creative process to come to fulfillment, allowing me to be me. So let me play you a little bit of what he sounds like. This is his composition, his notes he's making up in the spur of the moment, of course. I think these extracts demonstrate a desire on his part to be close to or to express the phenomenon of creativity and to seek it out. He places creativity squarely at the center of his music consciousness, evoking the social dimension of Glavenu's formulation. He prioritizes connection and communication with co-performers and non-performers. He sees the communicative moment as where everything that's about you comes out, i.e. it's literally expressed. Expression is tied up, he says, with, quote, developing your own sound, your own style of playing, your own way of expression. The expressive intention is recognition and acknowledgement, which he sees as a crucial source of additional energy. There's more energy when you're creative and being seen as creative. His performance also engages with the multiple material and cultural resources, for example, the mediational means, the drum kit, or technical abilities, another mediational means. Cultural expectations, the drummers should keep time, classic drum culture expectation. Or the highly embodied quality of his performance. Here, for example, his highly developed finger technique, for example, is a key determinant in the way he plays. A technical affordance, he would call that, that allows him to play softly with great articulation. He has conditioned the way he plays, it's, he says, <clears throat> so that, quote, I can, oft, I can play softer, maybe better than I can play louder. But when he's outgunned at the high dynamic levels in a particular saxophonist group, D, 
Different instruments are required. In this situation, his two med mediational means here, his instruments and his technique, both needed adaptation to sustain uh, creative action. So I'd say this is a soft compositional performance as a leader, orientated towards the creator. He's the guy who's in the first instance, the person he's playing to, who selects, this person selects, differentiates, communicates, is assessed and creativity attributed irrespective of domain change. He's not seeking to change the world, he's seeking to change his world. The, just so you see where we've got to, we're coming in from the left hand end. We've done hard functional, soft functional. One more to go, just <clears throat> because I don't want to keep you too much longer, but we'll just see a very hard functional compositional player. Uh, you might know the man in question whose name is Max Roach. You might not. 1924 to 2007, passed away sometime 10 years ago, it's come to embody everything reasonably considered to be creative on the drum kit. In the short period from approximately 1990, uh, 1944 to 1953, about nine years only, he redefined the role of the drummer in several areas, opening up new vistas for those who came uh, after him. Jazz drumming underwent a particularly fertile period in New York City post Second World War. The US federal government was taxing any venue that was offering singing and dancing. So instrumentalists were preferred to singers when it came to hiring, a good example of favorable environmental conditions for a drummer, if not a singer. In front of a seated audience, the musicians were able to fashion a tougher, less inclusive music. Roach is acknowledged as the founder of a modern style of jazz drumming that's become standard procedure for players in the mid 20th century. His unaccompanied drum pieces are conventionally regarded as a gold standard of creative practice. He has a lot in common with Blair Sinter here in the problem-solving aspect of this. He's confronted with problems which he, which he has to come up with a solution to. His first variation lay in a problem and its solution. The problem was unsustainable tempi. Until Roach's arrival, the bass drum was conventionally played four beats to the bar uh, in 4-4 four, four time, generally without accent, its primary function being to provide a steady beat for dancing, much like today, in fact. But marking out the steady four beats to the bar at Tempe around 300 BPM, which any of you know 300 BPM, it's kind of fast. It moves along at a nippy pace. Uh, for long periods, rapidly became unmusical, unfeasible, and in the absence of dancing, unnecessary. The solution was to assign the timekeeping, get it up off the floor. Instead of doing that, boom, 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 you could put it up here on a symbol. Uh, on the ride symbol, allowing a wholesale reinterpretation of what the bass drum could then do, because it was free to do other things, and a system which became known as dropping bombs. This is what life sounds like at 300 BPM. So with the rhythm, continue, you know, no one's going to play the bass drum like that at 300 beats a minute for more than an hour or two, let alone three hours in a club. So that's gone up to the ride cymbal, which is nice, with the rhythmic continuum now taken care of up there. His left hand on the snare drum and the bass drum are free to prod, cajole, comment and support in an endless conversation with and between each other and the top line melodic information. In discussion of Roach's work, the word conversation is often used specifically to describe the interaction between his limbs and more generally to describe jazz musicians' interaction within the ensemble. Here's an example at a slower tempo.
So this first variation of removing the, the continuum from the bass drum up to the ride cymbal was, uh, it seems to have prepared the ground really quickly for a second more conceptual in innovation. Almost simultaneously, Roach underwent a subtle shift in perspective which went on to inform the essence of his playing, most notably in his ability as a drum soloist. Crucially, he now came to see the drum kit as one instrument rather than a set of several. Back in those days, the drum kit was a, a, a rambling thing with lots of confused instruments and the, each, each percussionist played, each approached each instrument as if he was in a percussion orchestra. And so thinking of the drum kit as one instrument was something of a new idea, ha albeit handled by the, just the one. As the trap set was giving way to the trimmer standard drum kit, it, um, he, saw, he came to see it as one whole simple instrument. Like notes on a piano, his four limbs on any combination of the seven sort of standard instruments could produce chords, colours, and semi-definitely pitched melodies. Roach saw it architecturally. My first solo piece was called Drum Conversation. People would ask me, where are the chords? Where's the melody? I'd say it's about design. It isn't about melody and harmony. It's about periods and question marks. Think of it as a constructing a building with sound. It's architecture. And a little bit of this uh, last track I'll play you here from Big Sid. Um, it shows some of his favorite techniques within the AABA -A -A song form. For example, the stretching, compressing, the fragmentation of rhythmic motifs and their redeployment around multiple combinations of drums and cymbals. <coughs> The temporality of Glavenu's framework um, is assessed over a lifetime, and that comes into play here. He came to be credited with raising the level of drummer from the lowly functionary who kept time in the band uh, to equal conversationalist within the whole band, when, for example, trading fours with saxophonist Sonny Rollins. His work was widely acknowledged within and outside the domain, with numerous honorary citations from French and American academic communities in particular. But such assessments take time, maybe too soon to assess, for example, Sinter and Circus, and, and whether they generated lasting creativity at the domain level. The sociality of his creativity resided in interaction, in something he did with others, whether they were there in person or not. The materiality of his creativity resided in these twin reconceptions, the drum kit as one integrated instrument rather than several isolated ones, the reframing of drum solos in terms of structural design. So both, all, well, in fact, all, the, all the frameworks we've looked at, particularly Glavenu's, um, would indicate that works, Roach's work did indeed embody everything reasonably considered creative in instrumental performance the fluidity of his constant interaction with the ever-changing socio-cultural, technical, cultural, temporal, conceptual, material components of his performance practice resulted, I think, in high-level compositional creativity that changed forever the way drummers consider their instruments, themselves, and their own individual practices. So we've come along through that. I have argued then that creativity is a culturally situated human behavior, less a discrete expression of individual will, more an activity constrained by and mediated between multiple actors and agencies. 
if we must take home three bullet points or some, in the last slide, as it were, I think we might say that creativity is not a thing that you can point to. It's only or even, it's not only or even primarily about cognitive capacities, personality characteristics. Music creativity is a quality of the relationship. The, all the Glavenu stuff is relational. These things have to interreact, the actor, the affordances, and so forth. It connects two or more people together in a situation. A word much used by musicians, my situation. It's a great word, actually, because it's used in academia as it's used on the street. That composite of music experience, competence, cultural practice, people, instruments and instructions that together constitute the socio-musical environment in which the performer must live, breathe and perform. And to be creative, you probably need to effect and communicate significant difference. I should just say before I leave you that if I have tweaked your enthusiasm for this topic in any degree at all, I do have a book coming out <laughs> in early January and uh, I'll leave, it, leave you with that thought. Thank you very much for being a nice audience. Thank you. presentation only, not about the, the wider careers of our, uh, of our speakers tonight. So, do we have any questions for Dr. Bridford? Yes. Just, hang on a second, sorry. You mentioned um, uh, at the start of your piece that you were going to avoid classical uh, music because we're talking about popular music. Um, and then went on to describe um, uh, classical musicians and how they're, uh, there's no creativity and they're just vessels essentially for the, the composer. Um, would you think that maybe previously, uh, you know, like folk musicians or, I don't know, jesters or that type of thing, like, like before this, uh, I don't know what you just say, renaissance of... Um, culture changed where musicians became creative would they have been seen as creative would if the, if the term creativity was in common parlance would people in the 15th century have been considered creative uh, it's rather hypothetical um, I would say until the enlightenment they they would consider would have considered themselves but I'm no historian as craftsmen in the service of God Post-enlightenment, I think the idea of the individual arose and then the whole idea of creativity came forward in the 18th century and so forth. And it wasn't really until the APA, the American Psychological Association, addressed by J.P. Guilford, who said we need to find out something about creativity. Everybody seems to want this. And this was in 1950. But my point about the classical musicians and the, and the, um, and the composers whose attitude was that the performer was not to put himself, any of himself, into the music. That pertained, really, for quite a long time, until the mid-20th century, really. Now, I think performers are demanding a little bit more than that, in some way. Thank you. That was great. Um, mm. So, I got really fascinated with the, the functional, compositional continuum, yeah. as you were talking. Um, and I know you've not framed it as a dichotomy, but I, I wonder if it's problematic to have those two things at either ends of those spectrum of that spectrum. I'm thinking about two 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 issues with it. Firstly, how can something be truly compositional without functionality? Yeah. And then at the opposite end of things, does that suggest that if we're using compositional as a synonym for different? Could composition be a byproduct of lack of control? Well, the, the, the continuum is a continuum of control. It's just saying it's unbelievably hard to be highly functional when you're, uh, sorry, highly compositional when you're nailed to the ground under, with, with no agentive control when you're being instructed to do things. Difficult in Bonnie's position to be wildly compositional. 
I think you're right that, in fact, the title of my PhD at the end was Making It Work, that drummers, first of all, need to be functional. And all the compositional guys I spoke to, and the guys who like to live at the compositional end, say, oh, yeah, it's got to be functional first, and then it can become compositional. So in a way, the, 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 the continuum is one of control. But, but you're right that, that f to be compositional, you tend to be functional. You've got to make the music work. And that's a, the drummer. Drummers somehow grow up with that, with their mother's milk. Somehow, It's, it's what you do, is you somehow make it work. And there is a lot of creativity in that, I think, hence the functional end of it. Does that help at all? Yeah. No, you're unhappy. I no, no, I'm not unhappy. But I'm deeply honest. unhappy. I, I'm just really interested in it. I, I <laughs> wonder then, just as a sub-question, if that's all right, Brydon. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, 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 can you fake an existence at the compositional end of the spectrum? Can you fake? <laughs> I, I, can you fake an existence at the compositional end of the spectrum? Fake an existence? Yeah, can, can you... Pretend to can be you fake creativity. I, I feel can like I've been in positions musically where I've been with people who are pretending to be creative sometimes oh. as a lack of functional ability. Oh, <laughs> you're playing with the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> you're not that's, about me. that's weird. That's deeply Can't weird, and I've never come across that. Um, <coughs> I suppose you could pretend to be anything or anyone and fake it, but <coughs> I'm not sure that. That is a particularly creative thing to do, I think. Um, people get all artsy on you, whereas they can't really play, something like that. You're playing with the wrong guys, <laughs> definitely. Oh. Thanks for joining my band. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've got a question up there as well? Yeah, over, um, <laughs> kind of on a more a pragmatic level, <coughs> excuse me, after playing for a few years around. One of the biggest problems to creativity, I find, is the kind of narrow-mindedness and blinkeredness of peers, music peers of not just one band, or maybe it's me, I'm a drummer, I'm a dickhead, I don't know. <laughs> but no, you can't play that, it's not musically correct. But does it work? Oh yeah, it works, but it's not musically correct. Wow. How do you fight that? You should be in his band. It's it's just, just, <laughs> you guys have just such bad luck. I just don't, ha I don't meet these people. No, these I read about right. them, I hear about them from you guys. I don't yeah. meet these people. That's these people are around over 50 that, years of That is really <laughs> tricky, and immediately my mind comes to Asaf Siakis in the right-hand column where things are allowed or not allowed to happen. I have been in music situations where you see things starting to get creative, and people leave the room and go out, and you know, things get closed down because they don't want to go <coughs> that way. Um, so your colleagues in that situation are not allowing something to happen for some well, reason. Well, it's, it's their first recourse. It's something that is outside their comfort zone. They will, re they will recall, not just in this one, you know, sorry, not just in one instance, it's been over a variety of different band styles I've been playing over the life of my life. When you come up with something that actually might work, or in fact actually is proven later to work, by God, what a struggle to get And they acknowledge out. that, and they and acknowledge they that. Acknowledge it. Might take you two years of hammering away at them to say, <laughs> give it a bash, give it a bash, give it a bash. How do you fight that to make it quicker? Is it because we're just drummers? <laughs> oh, well, what was the other musician? Was he a, a, a drummer? Are you saying... Oh, no, this no, is to some other guy. Keyboard yeah. players, singers... I mean, how, how do you find that? that I mean, creativity in, implies change or yeah. transformation in some way or another, some kind of differentiation. If people aren't willing to entertain that, I don't think one can reasonably call them creative. Now, you can argue that everything in life is a problem, can be reframed as a problem that needs a creative solution. If I take, put one foot in front of another and walk towards the door, I'm solving the problem. You know, I, don't think it, I don't think it works that way. Mm. I think um, that's too generalized, and I think people have to be willing to change and allow things to happen. I like that allowing stuff that Circus was talking about. Yeah, we'd give it a try. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised yeah. and disappointed to hear that. I mean, it seems, well, what's, what's anybody got to lose? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take this one? Hey, sorry, oh, sorry. lady in the green jacket first, I think, sorry. Lady in the green jacket. <laughs> um, well, firstly, thanks for saying he and she when you refer to drummers. <laughs> That's appreciated. Um, it was just an observation really on, the, on your choice, and I was interested in your thought process around choosing the four drummers that you did, where you have 
the, the sort of printmaking school of playing, where it's just to, to copy something that's that's very precious. Uh, and then the, the other end, but moving through from pop through, uh, through to jazz as well, which is where you'd expect sometimes to see the most creativity happening. Um, what, what thought process did you go through when you were choosing those uh, players? It's hard to find somebody who's more hard functional than a tribute band drummer, I think. It seems to me in the DNA that, you know, they must do it that way. And in, in fact, Bonnie's line to the effect of that's what makes them really good at it is that they don't make any other changes, whereas other people play around with it a bit and they turn into covers bands. He stays exactly there. Uh, hard to find somebody further left on the screen than that, I think. So I, I ticked him off. You know, to, to find um, somebody who's become more creative after death, the temporality line, you need a dead guy, Max Roach, uh, who, who clearly uh, was kind of appreciated in his lifetime, but is even more appreciated now as kind of American icon. Uh, so that's those two extremes suited the job to me. But the harder, those are the easy ones. The harder stuff is the people in the middle, the enigmatic stuff. I particularly like Sinter's kind of working with and for, that cooperation. He'll only, good, great studio stuff, tremendous studio work. He'll only offer, he'll be very gentle. What does she, what she want? You know, does she need me to say something at this point? No, and they get a second, a second kind of, second, a, a very empathetic with the leader as to how this can be made better. And uh, other drummers I interviewed was uh, Chad Wackerman, you know him with James Taylor. You know Chad? Well, you know of Chad? Yeah. With James Taylor, very, very delicate situation. You know, James Taylor doesn't want a lot, but he wants it to be just right. And that business of getting that right is really superior kind of creativity work. So these people are on the, but yet it's got to be the part to the song. So that is very close to compositional, but it's, it's not. It's on the functional side. Are, the, are these reasonable examples of... Yeah. But, but I'm thinking about royalties as well, where I have friends who've performed Grammy Award winning albums, for example, and they haven't received the publishing royalties. And it's been a, but it's been, it's been a tussle between, you know, have I created this, you know, I might think of Steve Gadd, classic introduction, you know, and then where, where does that line Oh, uh, well, that's only... Sometimes it's very practical. Mm. It's the, it's I the think career, that's a... it's the earning a living, it's the royalties. It's but I think the, I what you're talking about there is a different issue. We're not talking about creativity there. Yeah. Uh, it may inhere in any or all of what you said, but we are talking about ownership. Mm. Who owns what in this oral production? Which is tricky to do, and typically if you come up with a great hook drum line like Steve Gabb, people throw you a couple of points you know, and say, oh, good job, mate, you know, or some extra money or something. You know. mm. But uh, drummers usually operate as Sinter did as the invisible composer. Mm. Quietly you're pushing or edging or nudging somebody into doing something because it'll make the track work. Mm. Okay, we've got one more. Yeah, oh, I was just going to say, like, a few weeks ago I had a bass lesson um, with my teacher, who's a sort of session guy, who's very session based. And... Um, I was playing along to a sight reading uh, thing, like sort of perfectly, and I just hit an octave up on my basses. I hit an octave up, and he went, he just stopped me, and he said, That's wrong, you can't play that, it's, it's just wrong, you can't do it from the piece. And he, he kind of gave me a, a wee lecture on how I'm not allowed to be creative at all, and that, you know, it's as a bassist, you should just do the simple stuff. I, I was really, I was like, Nah. <laughs> Because um, I'm like self-taught, so this is my first experience in a lesson. I think being self-taught has led me to be very creative in my approach to learning music. I've got to listen, I've got to play. And that's actually taught me to add my own sort of things to it. So I find it very hard not to add my own sort of little variations on the piece. I was just going to wonder, if he's right, what's the point in music? Because... Like, what's the point in playing the exact same thing that someone's telling you to play? Because it doesn't further music at all. It just... And you're, it's kind of meaningless to me. Well, it's, it's not for me. 
I, I agree. I don't really understand it particularly, but there are people who are functionally very happy to repeat on a nightly basis something that somebody else has told them to do. And it's, it's, it's a certain honour in, in hard labour. Uh, you know, but at that, at that level, I'm not sure there's anything particularly creative about it. Unlike some who think that just playing any kind of music is a creative thing. I would probably disagree. I think it can be quite uncreative, such as your, your teacher was suggesting. But I'm surprised to hear that from a teacher. You know, what is right and what is wrong? Right and wrong in music has been changing ever since somebody first picked up a musical instrument 2,000 years ago. You know, what's right and what's wrong is, is um, a big area. Um, and what's creative and what's not is somewhat different. Um, I have sympathy. I think I think we've had some terribly upsetting stories. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm I feel you know, and I've been very fortunate because I've worked with people who've given me these ideas, you know, and let me be very. I'm sorry. What were you saying? I was just saying, it's not like that exactly. This is okay. just, this is the only time I've encountered it really, and I was just saying, okay. it's it's not sad for me because I've been in those guys' situations a few years ago when I was like. 15 in a band and I just quit it because they're limiting your, mm. yourself and you just go and meet other people who do work mm. with it instead of waiting around and waiting for them to. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I just think the more creative you are, the more interesting it is. Like a drummer Pete Ray Biggin I met out of Level 42, he's a session musician but he's actually making the music more interesting. So he's more on the Blair Sinter lines. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, it kind of goes against and the and don't wish for freedom. You don't want freedom. Trust me. You want constraints, and often it's circling around constraints that makes you creative. Creative. All these guys have had problems. Have problems. What was the problem? Oh, the tempo's too fast. What am I going to do? You know, same with same with circus. I, I've got you know. How, oh, no, he's different because I gave you his perceptions of creativity. But Sinter had problems, so they're problem solving. And those are the constraints that everybody has in any artistic endeavor, and you have to circle around them and find a way out of it. And that's where creativity comes in, I think. That's great. Thank you very much.